Hello crypto cats, my name is Tom, I'm the crypto investor and it's time for the weekly market roundup. Sorry I haven't been with you for a week, I have been away on holiday and I still am on holiday and I'm trying to record this for you on a big screen that is making this quite technically difficult but it's, there's been so much going on in the world and in crypto that I really wanted to get a video out to you. Alright, anyway, jumping in, we can see that ETH is down 1% in the last 7 days at 2600, Bitcoin just slightly up 1.5% sitting at 39,000. Every time it tries to rear its head above 40,000, sellers are coming in and we are seeing the price pushed back down. Most of the other L1s are down as well, Terra Luna is the one that is bucking that trend. Uh, Luna has done 70% in the last three weeks, incredible. Um, that was the catalyst of them having a billion dollars of Bitcoin backing the UST native uh, stablecoin that they have. And no wonder to see this success. And of course, every time that UST is minted, Luna is burnt, Luna is deflationary. And I wouldn't be surprised to see UST continue to climb the charts. I personally would choose to use UST. I get 20% yield on UST with Anchor, with Nexo, um, and they've got a billion dollars of backing, whereas you can't say that for these other stable coins. So a year or two from now, maybe it'll be up here and representing a larger majority of the market share, and maybe Luna will be up to number three by market cap. We will see. All right, let's jump into the bubbles. So, uh, well, Anchor Protocol that I just uh, mentioned is down 34% after that big jump which we had seen. I'm not sure what has reversed that, but we'll look into it. We have Waves up nearly 50% for the week. Again, I'm not too sure what the Waves blockchain is, but it is making moves in this bearish times. Um, Zcash, ZEC, not surprised to see privacy coins doing well in the current climate with everything going on with Russia. 4chain, they are announcing some cool new synthetic DeFi solutions and have a lot of people excited. They're always innovating. Um, it's a strong project, so not surprised to see them up 37%. Phantom, of course, has been hit very hard. Uh, I think 50% drop overall in the last few weeks for Phantom on the back of Danny, DeFi 2.0, uh, Frog Army leader, um, announcing that they are basically pulling out of 25 different uh, DeFi 2.0 protocols, and most of those were on Phantom, so Phantom getting hit hard. In fact, let's have a quick look at that. On the chains, when we look at the total TVL locked in crypto, you can see that, uh, well, ETH is down 11% on the week, uh, sorry, on the month. Uh, Terra Luna is up 75% on the month. This is what is a big deal. So Luna now has nearly, well, it has a fifth of the total TVL of Ethereum. So it continues to add its market share. And this is why we're seeing the native token do very well. This is, of course, all because of uh, UST, which represents their TVL. Um, so big, big moves for Luna. Impressive to see. And looking at Phantom, so Phantom has lost 28% of its TVL in the last seven days, 24% in the last month. Um, but what's important to look at is this, market cap versus TVL. This is like a price to earnings ratio for a blockchain. And the lower the number, the better value it is. So you can see that Binance Smart Chain still is not good value, uh, even though it's been, you know, been losing, losing its, uh, well, despite losing its TVL. Whereas Phantom has is effectively a fifth of the price of Ethereum when you consider the market cap divided by TVL. So very, very low score in uh, market cap TVL ratio for Phantom. So it's cheap, but it has to now, of course, uh, and you know, it's a good blockchain, but it has to now attract new projects back to it so after losing all of, all of those projects, which is going to be no mean feat. Uh, Polkadot, when you measure it on this metric, very expensive at 14. Um, all right, so next I wanted to look at, you may have noticed that gas fees are cheaper than the actual gas fees in real life. Um, and this is due just generally to obviously less block space demand for Ethereum, but also because NFTs are, well, we're seeing the volume of NFT trading falling out of favor significantly as well. And it's no surprise really when you think about the macro headwinds that we're now facing uh, we start, everyone's starting to build a cash reserve. We, we recognize that a recession is looking increasingly likely due to the commodity uh, price increases that we're seeing due to the war uh, with Russia. We'll talk about that in a second. Um, but 
yeah, it doesn't feel like the time to speculate on a picture of a rock, does it? Um, JPEGs suddenly do feel overpriced. It does feel like the roaring uh, 1930s when we were so hedonistically uh, speculating on, on these JPEGs. And so, yeah, a lot of um, a lot less volume of NFTs. Uh, and this means that the issuance offset, so how deflationary Ethereum is, is going down significantly. So you can see 0 0.2 for the last seven days based on ever since ERP 1559. Uh, so yeah, one third of the burn, typical burn that we've been seeing of late. Um, so yeah, when we simulate that merge, instead of seeing ETH uh, deflationary by 2.3%, if we go on the last seven days of activity, we're seeing ETH deflationary by 0.6%. Still deflationary, but not as. Um, but yeah, we do have the merge coming up in two or three months. Just to remind you that ETH will become deflationary and it will pay a yield to validators. It won't be miners, but it will be token holders. You will get 10 to 20% yield on your Ethereum from June or so. Big, big, big deal. All right. So... We have to talk mostly about, not about crypto for the next five, 10 minutes, I'm afraid. So I'm not a geopolitical expert. There's plenty of people that know much more about this than me. I'm just a guy on the internet. This is not financial advice. I know that every talking head in crypto is suddenly an expert in this space. I don't want to be that person. I'm not that person. But we have to talk about it. So not every recession is led by a 50% rise in crude oil. But every time we've seen a 50% rise in the price of crude oil, we have seen a recession and it's no surprise everything everything we have everything you see around me requires oil to be produced to be shipped it is the backbone of our global economy so if oil goes up everything the cost of everything goes up um, and so this leads to inflation this leads to makes it, the margins for businesses to operate tighter and tighter and tighter and so it is a significant headwind for global economies and and it means that yeah, a recession becomes almost inevitable. And it's not just oil, of course. So Russia's the second biggest producer of oil that has the highest reserves of oil in the world. And so the uh, trade embargoes, of course, are leading to significant increases in the price of oil. But it's not just oil, it's wheat as well. Russia is also the second biggest producer of wheat, and it's just invaded the ninth biggest producer of wheat. And there was already some concerns about fertilizers and potashes before this, that we were going to get less yields. And every time we've seen wheat go up, we've seen civil unrest. We have to remember that many people live on the bread line. Um, and so last time we had high wheat prices, we had the Arab Springs. And most African nations, for example, don't uh, produce their wheat in country. They have to use their reserves to buy it. Uh, and so this puts heavy, um, uh, this is, is, is very expensive for nations to, to do, like they, if they're net importers and they're not producers of their own product. And it's not just wheat, we're seeing this with all commodities. So nickel, as you may have seen, gone up 300%. They're moving like shit coins. It's man, mad to see. Um, and just before I wanted to also say, is it here? No, it's not. That also, yeah, Sri Lanka, you may not have noticed little old Sri Lanka here. My friend was just there last week saying that they turn off the power every day for four hours. Basically, Sri Lanka is broke. It can't afford energy. It doesn't have the US dollars to buy energy. And they've just seen their currency drop by 30% on Friday. Um, and they have a financial crisis looming. And this is just the first of many nations you're going to see this happen over the next year. So people are broke. Countries are broke. This is a real two-prong hit from COVID without drawing breath to now a commodity crisis led by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. It's significant. And we are either going to have one or the other. We're either going to have high inflation or a recession. And I think we're going to have a bit of both, to be honest. It is a little bit bleak. But let's talk about why it could even be bullish for crypto. Um, I don't think it's going to be bullish for crypto as a whole. I think that many alts, particularly anything that has a high ownership of retail investors, is going to be hit hard. Um, but the ones that kind of represent stores of wealth, uh, Bitcoin namely, and n more and more to an understanding extent, Ethereum, could benefit from it. So Russian sanctions are driving people to crypto. The we We've seen not only that people in Russia, of course, are sanctioned. We've seen 
um, MasterCard and Visa and Google Pay and Apple Pay not working, and so people are first forced to look at different payment rails. But Russia as a whole themselves have had their assets frozen. So Russia's uh, gold in America is frozen, their euros in the European Union are frozen, and so they're forced to consider other options. And one option would be self-sovereignty of crypto assets. It's not ridiculous to say, and it's not just sovereign states that might be choosing to do that. Oligarchs are also going to be considering the same thing as they've been having their assets and their super yachts and their football teams frozen. And so, of course, they will be looking at other solutions. And again, it's not just Russians. We've seen the remarkable events in Canada of the uh, protesting truckers having their bank accounts frozen in Canada. And so I think we're going to hear more and more of this self-sovereign rhetoric, the idea of you know, not, your, uh, not your keys, not your coins. The fact that Russia is rug pulled by, by sovereign states. Um, yeah, it just, uh, the idea of self-custody of assets becomes more and more important. And so then talking about inflation, um, I can't see, I can't get rid of this, but you may not have known as well that the US has just signed another spending bill of $1.5 trillion. They've printed 45% of all the US dollars in history in the last 18 months, and they've just added another, I don't even know what that represents, few more percent, another 3 or 4% maybe. Um, significant, okay, 1% of this is aid. So 13.6 billion is aid to Ukraine, and that's what the guise of it's going under. But this is just more money printer go burr. It's more inflationary pressure. Um, you know, they're meant to be concerned about inflation, but on the other hand, they're spending like madmen. Um, and it really continues to undermine sovereign uh, fiat currencies. And this report from Credit Suisse saying, are we witnessing the birth of a new world monetary order? Money may never be the same again after the Ukraine war. History tends to be very slow and then move very quickly in a matter of weeks. And I think that's what we're seeing right now. Uh, and if you haven't watched uh, or if you haven't read Ray Dalio's book, about the changing world order. Ray Dalio is one of the most um, successful and celebrated investors in the world. Uh, this man knows his shit. He's done a distilled version of his book on YouTube, 43 minutes long, watch it. And he will talk about how we've seen this cycle play out time and time again with the Dutch empire, with the British empire, and now the American empire. And it's very clear to see that the American empire is now approaching that kind of slow state of decline with high disparities of wealth, um, record levels of distrust in government, um, political polarization, um, and yeah, it just this printing can only go on to so far. Um, you know, they have the luxury position of having the world's uh, reserve currency until they don't, and we will see that over the next. I'm not talking the next months or year or two, but probably over the next decade or two, we will really see them handing the baton over to China or to a global digital currency backed by commodities or by, by digital currencies. Who knows? Anyway, that's enough macro stuff. Let's get into crypto. So the big news of the last week was that Biden's executive order on crypto was met by relief by industry players. He didn't say I'm outright banning cryptocurrencies. He actually said that they are looking to support crypto innovation in this space. Uh, and they want to maintain their technological leadership in this rapidly growing space. Just like the internet wasn't banned in 1990, crypto isn't banned. The internet obviously has nefarious and abhorrent um, things on it in dark corners from child porn to whatever. And so does crypto, but it doesn't represent crypto as a whole. Uh, you know, um, tra transactions on the dark web for, for drugs or ferrous or whatever may be represent less than 1% of transactions. And so you can't ban electricity or the internet or crypto and they recognize this which is great to see it means we will get a regulatory framework and when we have a regulatory framework then really big money will be jumping in um but yeah make of that what you will but it's overall pretty bullish the, the mo most bullish really news we've had on crypto has come out of, of the US government, which is extraordinary. Stripe are launching payment support for crypto uh, through FTX, which is excellent. This is a big on-ramp and off-ramp for crypto. I have a business I use Stripe with, and now I can take crypto payments directly through there. They previously were against crypto, and now they're for it, so that's really good to see. Um, the South Korean new South Korean president is uh, crypto-friendly, 
Um, so ICX has surged on the back of this. I think that's a South Korean exchange. Um, and also Luna is doing well on the back of this. I'm sure that they've pulled some strings there. But this is one of the first major uh, developed nations we've seen with a crypto-friendly president, and it won't be the last. And again, maybe they will look to have 1% of their, foreign, of, their, of their sovereign reserves in cryptocurrencies by the end of his term. Who knows? Um, but it's all slowly happening. And Dubai have just adopted an, a crypto law um, saying that they will basically have a framework for, for a cryptocurrency uh, support within their emirate, not nation. Um, so Dubai quickly has emerged as a, as a very crypto uh, friendly uh, location, as has Thailand, which are easing their rules for crypto. They're reducing the tax on cryptocurrencies and trying to attract people with crypto. No surprise as well, because the Thai king owns the biggest exchange in Thailand. eBay are releasing a digital wallet after, well, teasing about a digital wallet after last week, saying that they will be adding crypto to their um, to their website. So another big company adding crypto. Goldman Sachs are adding a ETH fund with Galaxy Digital, which is bullish for, for ETH as a whole, and again, further adoption. All right, MetaMask and Infura blocked certain areas for crypto sanction. Um, so we saw Venezuelans and Iranians unable to use MetaMask, and it seemed like it was a MetaMask problem. It was actually their back-end uh, relay service called Infura, which is a centralized provider of relays. And interestingly, MetaMask and Infura are both owned by the same company, or partly owned by Consensus, and Consensus is partly owned by JP Morgan, so we're getting less and less centralized. Is it really web-free? Feels less and less like it. But if you wanted a neutral version of Infura, of course, the place to get that is Pocket Network, which I've shielded a number of times on this channel. And Pocket Network's price has been horrible um, since I shielded it. So of course, the broader crypto market has been horrible, but Pocket has been hit particularly hard. Uh, I still remain as bullish and have a stronger resolve as I ever have on it. And in fact, I have means to be more bullish in that we have just seen in the last uh, few days, out of nowhere, Polygon are now the second biggest producer of relays on Matic, and they've increased by 130% or so in the last 24 hours, I believe. Uh, and they've come into second place. And I wouldn't be surprised to see them maybe go into number one. And Matic is a, obviously a big, prodigious blockchain. They do a lot of stuff in the gaming space. Gaming has a lot of relays, a lot of balance lookups, etc. So Harmony was most of the relays through DeFi kingdoms, um, but that was not very diversified really. So it's great to see Polygon pushing up the charts and hopefully that continues and they really lean on Pocket. I am as bullish as I ever have been on Pocket, but the you know the overall broader market is a tough one. Um, and I, you know, I wouldn't say, I would say playing it safe in the big, um, uh, the big mega caps of Bitcoin and Ethereum, and to a lesser extent, Luna, is still the safest place to be right now. But I'm continuing to compound my position in pocket, personally. And just confirming, I mentioned that Andre, Web, um, DeFi 2.0, Frog Army, Bastion, etc., etc., and Anton have said that they're pulling out of 25 different DeFi projects that they created from Yearn.Fi, not Yearn Finance, uh, Keeper, um, Solidly, and um, as well as obviously uh, Ohm and uh, Redactive Butterfly, Olympus DAO, all that kind of stuff as well. All right. Um, I am away for the next month, I'm afraid. I have my real job, my proper job. I run a company called Desert Island Survival. I take people to tropical desert islands. That's my job. Um, and we are um, in Panama running free expeditions back to back for the majority of April, but I will be back in May. If you would like me to be back in May, if you do value these videos and you want me to continue to do this, then please do let me know and I will um, I will endeavor to still put these videos out for you. Um, and yeah, please do like and subscribe and all that good stuff. All right, let's jump into the charts. We'll start with the uh, S&P 500 just because we've seen such strong correlation between the equity markets and crypto. And you can see that we continue to be in this very much downward trend, unable to break above this trend line. Uh, we had a fake out last week, but we came back down below it. We now have the lowest close we have seen since uh, June. So 
there we go, 10 months of, of upside given back now. It's the worst start for equity markets in a year since the Great Depression, um, but they're getting cheap. And if you divide this by M2 money supply, you can see we're now lower than where we were before COVID got going uh, and all that money got injected into the system. But potentially we continue to bleed out further. Uh, you know, these are very challenging and uncertain times. And in challenging and uncertain times, gold tends to do very well. Um, my video three weeks ago, I mentioned, of course, that we uh, were breaking out of this two-year pennant formation. We have since broken out, and this could be the beginning of a multi, you know, multi-year move for gold. It's hard to say. It's an extremely tough asset class to understand. But previously in recessions, gold has been one of the best assets to be holding, um, and so we would imagine that's continued to be the case. It went all the way up to its previous all-time high, uh, and has uh, since pulled back. Um, this will be an interesting week for gold, whether it can break past this. And if it does, it will really, really start to move. Um, or if it forms a double top and fails, we will see. But gold doing what you would expect. And this is why I'm still maintaining my bullish thesis on crypto, because it's digital gold. It's less manipulated. It's easier to store. And so it represents, in these times, a very important asset class. It's undeniable. All right. Keep telling yourself, Tom. Total market cap of crypto is, let's just move this on to weekly. As I said, it's really hard to use this big TV, but I'm trying my hardest crypto cats. I really am. All right, so you can see that in crypto for the second week in a row, we've rallied and then we've given back. We've seen selling come back into the market and we've come back exactly to where we are again as well. So we're really, we're not going up, we're not going down. We're just... Uh, sideways I think waiting for for something to happen and that's on the back of some really quite bullish catalysts um, but there's a lot of people scared a lot of people feel that you know that this is the beginning of a multi-year bear market and and we've been bitten quite hard in the past and so of course many people are very very nervous but the fact that we are holding up as much as we are I think is is fairly bullish and I say that there is reason to be optimistic based on those factors I was just mentioning um, about the parallels effectively with gold so we will see we are under this major trend line, which I think coincides with a 100 day moving average. Uh, we need to get back above here before we can really start to feel optimistic. Um, but like I said, I think it's the, the big dominant cryptocurrencies that will continue to see the, um, the most success. Uh, stable coins, of course, in 2008, we didn't really have stable coins to much of an extent. People weren't comfortable. We had UST emerging, but that money left and went into fiat. This time, all of that money is there on the blockchain waiting to be deployed back again. People earning their 10, 20 percent or so. And so, you know, we didn't have that as well. Oops, looking at Bitcoin, almost identical correlation to the broader market. No surprise because Bitcoin is representative of 33% of the total market cap of crypto. But you can see that we came up, we almost broke back above here and gave it up. And then the same this week. Really, Bitcoin either will break 34 and then move down to 30 and perhaps lower, or we need to get above 46 and above 46, we march higher. So we really are, I mean, I still see this as crab market time. We are, we're going sideways. We've been going sideways since the beginning of the year. Um, and and we'll break out one way or the other, depending on which which rhetoric wins. But if you hold your money in cash, you're losing 15% a year. If you hold your money in equities, they're very expensive. Government bonds are okay, but I don't know, our sovereign notion, nation's going to survive. Um, there's no easy place as an investor. And, uh, and I feel like Bitcoin and Ethereum are as good a place as any to protect one's wealth, particularly if you're earning yield. Okay, looking at Ethereum, we are at 2,544. Again, looking like we were potentially breaking out above this channel, um, only to give back those gains. But once more, getting to that shit or get off the pot moment for Ethereum, uh, we're either going to really break down here or we're going, to, we're going to start to see it break back up. We will see how it plays out. And looking at that ratio between ETH and Bitcoin, we have lost this critical well this is Sunday afternoon let's see how we close out but we've lost this critical trend line for now um, which could mean that ETH will continue to lose value versus Bitcoin should this be the case and the, the you know the adage is uh, ETH in times of peace Bitcoin in times of war and generally when the market's going up 
ETH will outperform and when the market's going down, Bitcoin will outperform. So it's no surprise we're seeing this. But we do have the merge for Ethereum on the horizon. We do have 10% yields. We do have deflationary currencies. We do have, I guess, a lack of understanding that ETH is money within the market as well. So I'm not changing my consensus. I'm still holding most of my reserves in Ethereum because long term I still feel that we go further. But this could be, yeah, we'll, we'll see how this plays out. All right. Metaverse tokens versus Ethereum continue to bleed out. DeFi continues, oh, that's US dollar. DeFi continues to kind of go sideways in US dollar. Uh, DeFi versus Ethereum continues to be the most depressing chart in crypto. Yeah, you can just kind of get an idea. Um, we've seen record Bitcoin shorts. Well, not record, but the highest since back in June. We've seen a 200% increase in the shorts in the market. So that could lead to a short squeeze or it could they could be right. We will see. But there are an increasing number of shorts coming into the market. Terra Luna, as I said, three massive weeks for Luna. Very sizable move. Um, top to bottom, it was a 120% move since giving back some of those gains. It's still 90% up for the three weeks. Um, whether we have a double top forming here uh, or if we're going to continue to see Luna push on, I don't know. But still, it's looking pretty solid. And when you look at Luna's dominance, you can see that Luna's dominance is now nearly 2% of the total market cap of crypto. It's the only cryptocurrency which I'm seeing increase in dominance. Um, when we look at Bitcoin's dominance, which is the other one that has been going up, it's starting to top out now a little bit there. Um, and ETH's dominance is down from 22% to 18% now. And again, holding on this trend line, we will see. It's uh, Next week or two is going to be very interesting for crypto. I think we're, we're at inflection points on many of, the, on many of the charts. The dominance, of course, is going into stable coins. And we're seeing um, Tether almost at all time highs. But again, you could see like it's 5% has been somewhere that Tether has not got above. So you can see one, two, three. Will it be a third time rejection or, or break above here? Um, USDC also at record highs. But Tether getting less and less of the market share. And this is all again because of UST. Terra Luna, look at this, just going from strength to strength. And it makes sense. Of course, you're gonna choose the one which has the billion dollars of backing. Um, and the 20% yield, but it's on less and less, it's on less interfaces as the others and less trading pairs, but slowly coming into Binance and others. All right, that's a lot, isn't it? I hope you found it useful, Crypto Cats. I'll speak to you in a month. I'm sorry to take so much time off, but needs must. I've got to go to a desert island. Um, if you found it useful, please like and subscribe. And I'm just a guy on the internet. This is not financial advice, and I'll speak to you very soon. All the best. Cheers.